seek refuge in Allah against Shaitan the rejected. And I begin with the name of Allah, the eternal source of mercy and grace. I greet you with the greetings of peace. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon one and all of you on this day of Eid. I hope this birthday brings you great happiness and joy as well as the special blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. My topic today is Eid al-Adha, the connection with Taqwa and Taqwa being the twin sister of justice. For those of you who are familiar with the verse governing today's celebrations, we we'll recognize that Taqwa, which means God consciousness, and sometimes when we use the word Taqwa, we think it to be something abstract. But we should understand Taqwa from the Quranic perspective. It's a very unique and important word in the life of a believer. Taqwa means a certain type of consciousness. A consciousness which drives our behavior. So in other words, our behavior becomes a reflection of our state of consciousness or our taqwa. So taqwa is not some sort of abstract consciousness, but it's a state of mind that is reflected within our actions. And this God consciousness, this taqwa, is what underlies today's celebrations. The verse that the Imam quoted during the khutbah, he paid careful attention to it, says, It is not their meat, nor their blood, talking about the sacrificial animals, that reaches Allah. It's not their meat, nor their blood, that reaches Allah. It is the taqwa, the God consciousness, that reaches Him. So what we see from this is that the Qur'an is not focused just on the form of things, but it's focused on what impact these rituals have on our lives which drive us closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now if you look at the term taqwa, the term taqwa, Allah says in Surah 5 verse 7, when I refer to it as the twin sister of God consciousness. Because for some of us, as I said earlier, God consciousness may just be some sort of abstract belief in Allah and an association with being Muslim. But when you look at the way the Quran talks about taqwa, and how it uses the word and what it associates taqwa with. It's quite interesting. So 5 verse 7 Allah says, اِعْدِلُوا هُوَ أَقْرَبُ taqwa." Do justice or act upon justice. هُوَ أَقْرَبُ It is the closest. In other words, it's connected, it's interconnected with piety, with taqwa, with God consciousness. I chose the word twin sister. Deliberately. I chose the description to and sister deliberately. Just to remind myself and remind us of the important part that women play in being the driving force towards upholding righteousness and justice. Not hankering after the latest fashion or playing second fiddle to their male counterparts, but standing side by side is the Quran says, Al Mu'minuna wal Mu'minatu ba'aduhum awliya wa ba'ad. The believers, male and female, are awliya to one another. In the context of Iman, in other words, they side by side work towards those goals which the Quran has laid out for them. And we'll come to these goals just now. Unfortunately, the Muslim world has been plagued by some amongst the male gender who feel that they are superior simply because of their gender and cause all sorts of pain and suffering 
to our better halves. This is a day where we speak about taqwa, where we open up, where we should confess about our issues, and that we should put measures in place to address these issues in the home. And the way some of us treat our women, the three talaqs in one, she wakes up tomorrow morning, she's no longer married. And when she's no longer married, she's not entitled to a proper maintenance, etc. They're left out on the streets. They don't get their fair share of inheritance, etc. Now these are issues that affect taqwa, that affect adam. And if you don't speak out against it, and if you don't do something about it, then our condition worldwide will not change. Because internally, we're going to be in strife. So this day of Eid al-Adha is inextricably linked to the conclusion of the gathering of Muslims at Hajj. It's the conclusion of Hajj and so we have the celebration. So the Hajj connection with today is inseparable. What is Hajj supposed to mean to us? Hajj is supposed to be our global conference. The term Hajj implies a level of communication, putting forth an argument. At our global center, appointed for us by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at Makkah, we learn of the League of Nations, of the United Nations, only in the modern day and age. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in His infinite wisdom has presented us with this opportunity more than 1400 years ago. Alhamdulillah. Who would ever foresee that this valley in Makkah, that is on the face of it, there's nothing there, it's so unattractive. That Allah says, call them and they will come to you on every mode of transport. In other words, they will go through toil and labor and suffering to come here. Why? Because Allah has designated that place as an international gathering for the Ummah, to mobilize and galvanize the Ummah. Now, having an international center together gives us the opportunity to create this international home. But we have to start at the beginning. We have to start by looking at what is the role and objective of the Ummah and how does this link up with Eid al-Adha. Some of us would like to trivialize the deen to confine it to personal matters only as though Islam came with a fashion revolution. So some of us insist on dressing like Arabs. But Islam came beyond that. Allah says, وَلِبَاسُ taqwa, The clothing or the garment of taqwa, of consciousness, again of taqwa, of God consciousness, ذَلِكَ khair. That is the most appropriate. So Allah appeals to the mindset of the people, of the adherents to the Islamic faith. And it wants them to transcend beyond culture. So we appreciate the diversity in culture. Instead what we've done, we've abused the terms spirituality and prayer and used these as a diversion from the matters which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has chosen to focus on in the Qur'an. What are these issues? When one reads the Qur'an, the pages are filled with social justice. You can hardly pass a chapter without the issue of social justice being mentioned. The story of Musa and Pharaoh is the most mentioned story in the Qur'an. Nabi Musa's name is the most frequently mentioned in the Qur'an. And what's the story about? It's about this chap called Pharaoh who was an oppressor. And Musa al-Islam's task is to go and tell him to release the Bani Israel from bondage. What's that about? It's about human behavior. Then the Qur'an says in Surah Hadith verse 25, the purpose of revelation is لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا رُسُلَنَا بِالْبَيْنَاتُ وَأَنزَلْنَا مَعَهُمُ الْكِتَابِ And we gave them the scripture وَمِيزَانِ and the balance لِيَقُومَ النَّاسُ بِالْقِسْطِ To give them an opportunity to establish social justice. Whether we take this opportunity or not rests with us. So what has Allah established as a task for the Ummah? It's established as a task for us to be Ummatan وَسَطَى لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَاءَ عَلَى النَّاسِ we have made you a justly balanced community so that you 
may be a policing force or watchers or observers over the rest of humanity. So already at 1400 years ago, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is addressing us as an internationally active community. A community that will ensure that there's justice in this world. A community that will ensure that 24,000 children don't die every day of starvation. A community that will ensure that not one child dies of starvation. That will be our measure on the day of judgment before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that is a reflection of our taqwa. Now if that is a reflection of our taqwa, then I can tell you now that 10,000 children are dying in Yemen alone after the Saudi incursion. These 10,000 10, children are added to the list of casualties worldwide. It's called human engineered disasters. If that is a benchmark and a standard for taqwa, then we can't even begin to, to, to apply the word taqwa to us as an international community in any way, shape or form. Because we're keeping quiet about this conflict. It has everything to do with today's celebrations. Because it has everything to do with taqwa, because taqwa has everything to do with alam. We can't see our deen as an isolated, trivialized thing. Come to mosque, pray, go home, and it's over. It just doesn't apply in Islam. Surah 5 verse 7 deals with that in one stroke of a pen. Allah has appointed the Kaaba, the sacred house, as a means of support for mankind. So, Allah has established our role as an Ummah. But he hasn't left it there. He's given us a center where we can get together and give us an opportunity to discuss these issues. There is no better gathering than Al Hajj, where the entire world, there's such a big waiting list, you can't get all the people in there. You, won't, you probably won't get them there in a lifetime because there's such a big waiting list. This center, has got a purpose. جَعَلَ اللَّهُ الْكَعْبَةَ الْبَيْتَ الْحَرَامِ قِيَامًا لِلنَّاسِ So coming from the center should be an objective for the world. We want to achieve قِيَامًا لِلنَّاسِ What is قِيَامًا لِلنَّاسِ? قِيَامًا لِلنَّاسِ is to keep mankind standing alright. The Kaaba is accordingly not naturally bestowed with extraordinary powers by itself. And the Hujjad, alhamdulillah, completed the Hajj and they returning home. But ask them if the Kaaba is automatically bestowed with extraordinary powers. No, it's not. It's what you and I make of it. Allah has given us that responsibility. He's given us the opportunity. And He says, take the opportunity. Use this opportunity to fulfill the purpose which I have designated the Kaaba for. In other words, to use it as a platform to address issues of social justice and keep the relations between human beings harmonious. So when we look around today, what do we see? We see a bleak picture when it comes to Adam, that connection with Taqwa. The place that Allah has designated is Qiyam al nas and the place where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala associates with peace, Allah says, وَمَنْ دَخَلَهُ كَانَ آمِنًا Whoever enters it, enters into a state of security and peace. Ibrahim alayhi salam's dua is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to ensure that this place or to provide that this place be one of peace and security. But coming out of this place is what the number one arms procurer in the world. Peace and weapons, that amount of weapons. And what do we find from the very same place? The bombs raining down on Yemen. Aided and abated by the so-called Muslim countries and the Western powers who remain so silent and supply these arms to cause untold amount of misery and fortune, misfortune. We keep quiet about this. The very animals that we are going to sacrifice today, those very animals in Hajj and in here will be afforded more rights and will be given a more dignified treatment than our brothers and sisters in Yemen, in Syria, etc. What has gone wrong with the Ummah? Because we've trivialized our deen. We separated the issue of justice from taqwa. You don't need to be a seven-year qualified person and flowing in the Arabic language to be able to make this determination. You don't need it. You just need a, a, a mind.
which need a brain. There's something seriously wrong with us. How does one justify that more than two years, for more than two years, Yemen, that happens to be the poorest Middle Eastern country, the poorest of the Arab countries, has been under such a relentless attack that even the livestock have not been spared. The United Nations have referred to this as a deplorable, avoidable and completely man-made catastrophe. If I ask you today what you're going to have for lunch, what am I going to have for lunch? I know what's on the menu. I know what's on the menu. I'm going to go home, I'm going to have a good lunch and I'm going to spend time with my family. How would I feel if my fellow Muslim, who is bestowed with oil wealth, with Hajj wealth, with tourism wealth, uses all of those resources to bombard me, to bombard my livestock, to cause 10,000 of my children to die every single month, and that the rest of us here will just carry on our lives like as though nothing has happened. <laughs> Indeed, the, the believers are a brotherhood. فَأَصْلِحُوا And the Quran refers to continue this amendment. Ensure that your state is one that is continuously... You know, it's like when you've got a shirt and there's a little uh, uh, part that's torn off. What happens? If you leave it, what happens? It expands and it grows. And before you know it, your garment is worth nothing. The Quran wants it. فَأَصْلِحُوا بَيْنَ أَخْوَيْنَ Keep this on the continuous amendment. Don't allow for this to happen. Had there been one word about the suffering and about resolving it during Hajj? No. What about Surah Hujurat? We just covered it now. What about the <coughs> Hajj of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam? Has there been one issue about Palestine? One, one word about Palestine? The ongoing conflict there. And our Muslim brothers and sisters under the knife. Everyone is about Palestine. The one thing that unites the Muslim world is their views on Palestine. But even that issue hasn't found its way on the agenda of the speech at Hajj. The speech at Hajj given by the Prophet was On the day of Hajj al-Akbar, the Prophet makes his announcement. The Prophet offers the Mushriks an opportunity for peace. They broke the agreement and he says to them, come to back to the terms of the agreement. I'm giving you four months to do so, and if you don't do so, you're going to have to face the consequences of a full-scale war. Only to those of you who broke the agreement. This is on Hajj, addressing issues that affected the Ummah at the time. The, we call that the forgotten Sunnah. So coming closer to home, what happens today? To conclude, what does the sacrifice mean to us? What does this verse mean to us? It is not their meat nor their blood that reaches Allah. It is your piety that reaches Him. When we look at this verse and we apply our minds carefully to it, it doesn't have, it doesn't say much about the slaughtering of the animal. Allah doesn't say you must wear this kind of a cloth or you must you must recite certain things before, like you know, the simple. Allah focuses on something completely different. He focuses on wala kin, yanaluhu taqwa. He focuses on the taqwa. So he focuses on the attitude and the spirit, that is the God consciousness with which the sacrifice is undertaken, rather than the actual form. What does Allah consciousness imply? What does it imply to us? What Allah says after this verse is, feed, eat you and feed the poor. Immediately it attaches our God consciousness and our sacrifice with the plight of the poor. Immediately. Now when you consider that more than 24,000 children die daily due to man-made disasters, and that the world's eight richest people have more than 50% of the wealth of the entire of the entire world population. 50% of the entire world population. In other words, all the people in the world, half of them, 
half of every person in this world. The eight richest have more wealth than them. Taqwa as the twin sister of justice means that we strive to assist the less fortunate and make their lives more comfortable. That we speak, that we seek to create job opportunities, higher levels of skill and empowerment so that they become economically independent. This is what Taqwa requires of us as believers. And we have Hajj as a perfect platform to launch these ideas. Have the Muslim world done anything meaningful? Think about it. We are Muslims, we are part of this Ummah. Have, have our leaders sat down and said, let's do something for the world, let's build a dam, or let's sort Sudan out, or let's sort the issues in a certain part of the Muslim world out to create job opportunities. We're the highest consumers in the world. In fact, during Eid, the shopping bills go up so high, the entire world is celebrating and enjoying economic prosperity as a result of our spending. What about ensuring that some of the beneficiaries in the supply chain are Muslim? Some of the manufacturing should take place by Muslims and pay them good wages. <coughs> Empower them. No. We don't think of this. Have the Muslim world done anything meaningful? I think no. On an individual level, yes we have. But on a global scale, to make a real meaningful contribution so that the world can come to recognize and admire the Allah Muhammad, we've done very, very little in the modern day and age. We pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we, and in particular our leaders, open our hearts and minds to His message and that through this we implement our day, through this implementation, our days of Eid will become universally joyful. The joy that I feel, I would like my brother and sister in Yemen, in Syria, in Palestine, in Sudan, to feel the same, same time of security, peace, as well. Unless I don't have that as a desire in my heart and I don't strive for them, I think I have a problem before Allah on the Day of Judgment. Because Allah assures us, Inna Allah la yughayiru ma bi qawmin hatta yughayiru ma bi anfusi that Allah will not change the condition of a community unless we change what is within us. In other words, we have the power to bring the change. Allah has bestowed us with the skills and the talents and the abilities to bring this change. I thank you for your time and take this opportunity on behalf of the Al-Asad Masjid to wish one and all of you a happy and joyous Eid to those who are sick, may Allah grant them shifa, to those who have lost families, family members, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant you sabr. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. We conclude our program with a short dua. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. اللهم أنت السلام ومنك السلام وإليك يرجع السلام فحينا ربنا بالسلام ودخلنا جار السلام تباركت ربنا وتعاليت يا ذا الجلال والإكرام ربنا افر علينا صبرا وثبت أقدامنا وانصرنا على القوم الكافرين ربنا زدنا علما اللهم اهدنا الصراط المستقيم اللهم صل على سيدنا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه سيدنا محمد وعلى جميع الأنبياء والمرسلين سبحان ربك رب العزة عما يصفون وسلام على المرسلين والحمد لله رب العالمين